Thanks, guys, for leading us. Look forward to you. You got a Bible, you got an e-Bible, you got a version. go to Genesis. You're going to be in Genesis. I'm not going to put it up there yet, Marty, but we're going to be in Genesis. Just kind of hang out in Genesis. We'll get you there uh, in a minute. We're going to talk about something today that most people don't like to talk about. Yeah, that's where we'll go. We can hang there. I don't know what chapter that is. What chapter is that? 2 8. Genesis 2 8. You'll get ahead of me. Go ahead. Talk about something you don't normally talk about. Uh, well, we can talk about it. Right? We don't like to talk about it. Um, it's a bad word. Uh, and, and our culture doesn't like to use it. They've found other words to use for it. Uh, like we, 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 even as Christians, have dumbed it down a lot. Uh, it, it's called sin. Uh, we don't want to be told that we sin. We don't want to be told anything we do is wrong. Uh, we want to be told that you know that, that it's okay. Uh, and, and the grace gift was really cool because Graham said, "Are you going to do anything about grace?" I was like, "Nah, nah, nah no grace today. Uh, it's you know, see us in November. We'll talk about grace." But no, really, it it it, it, it marries that. So I want you to don't forget that skip. Okay? You need to remember that skip. And then you need to marry that with, with the sin we're going to talk about. And you're going to understand in your own heart what God's saying to you about sin as it pertains to grace. You're going to, you're going to make the connection today that I'm not going to make. Okay? Because it's different in all of your life because of where you are in your grace walk and in your sin walk. You're going to understand we, we all have a sin walk. Uh, we're not supposed to, but we have one. And we're just not really honest about it all. We, we, like I said, we kind of cloud it over. But the early Christian movement had a, had a famous list, and it's still kind of around here today. It's called the seven deadly sins. Do y'all know what they are? Yeah, I'll give them to you. You remember pride, envy, anger, laziness, greed, gluttony, and lust. Yeah, you need to remember that. Put that down on the list somewhere. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. But if you look at that list, if you, if you know that list, you'll understand it, as I do it, that I've, that I've committed those sins. And probably repeatedly. Probably hit some of them today. Already. And what time are we? For those of us who are on time, because it's spring now. 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock, and, and some of us have already hit that list. Or even since they didn't even hit that list. They make that list because a lot of sins can just kind of be subcategorized underneath one of the seven deadly ones. You, you understand that all sins are deadly, though, right? I mean, there's billions of sins. They're all deadly. And we're not going to talk about any of them today. I'm not going to tell you what your sin is. I'm not going to tell you what actions you're doing today are sin. I'm going to tell you the attitudes you've got are sin. I'm not going to talk about any of them. Guess what? The Holy Spirit's going to do all that work inside of you. So I expect to see a little bit of, maybe a little squirm, okay? Maybe, maybe, a little, maybe look at your clock. Here's you. Look at your watch right now. Look at your watch. Okay, now I know what you all look like. The next time you look at your watch, you're thinking about the sin that we're talking about. All right? So now I know that we're communicating, okay? You've got to have mnemonics and stuff back and forth. So the next time you look at your watch, just be thinking about the sin that, that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of. And when we're done looking at our watches, then we know that the Holy Spirit's done its work. Right, Robert? Sound good? Uh -huh. Now, you see, nobody's going to know what time to get done. It's okay. But this creates a problem. The, the sin. The fact that we're a sinner. The fact that we need to just understand that we're sinners. Okay? Saved by. Right. That's right. That's not an excuse, okay? Well, I'm just a sinner. Saved by grace. I'm a, I know I'm a sinner. But I'm saved by grace. You need to understand that we're a sinner. And what that does to us. And what that does in our relationship. And what that does in our life. We, we don't need to focus necessarily on it. But we need to understand it. We need to remember it. We love grace. And we should love grace. And we should live in grace. And it should be our umbrella. But we need to understand why we even have it. We have grace because we're sinners. We have grace because there's sin that interacts with our life and messes us up. Without sin, there's no need for grace. So the fact that you even have grace should always remind you that you're sinner. I don't think it necessarily does all the time. I think you just remember the grace and forget the sin. But how do I understand the sin? What's it doing to me? Why do I continue? 
continue to sin over and over again. Do any of y'all have some sin in your life that you do over and over? There you go. There you go. We don't do this. <laughs> now you can do that. That's okay. Because you're communicating all over the place today. That's good. And so where's God in all my sin? What have you decided in your personal walk where God is? I sin. I have grace. Where's God? What does God do? You've already answered that question in your heart. You've already got your grace, sin, map, done. You and God, or you have your conversation worked out with God. Have you ever said something like, God understands me? God knows my heart. You ever said that? God knows my heart. Sad news is you're right. He does. What you're communicating is, God knows I didn't really mean to. And yet you're actually communicating all over the place. Of course you meant to. Because you're a sinner. Because sin is in your life. Brendan Mandro, he wrote a book called The Ragged Muffin Gospel. Have you ever read that? I encourage you to get that book. You've never read it. I don't do a lot of books. It's hard for me to keep my attention reading the whole book. But he wrote this in one book. When I get honest, I admit I'm a bundle of paradoxes. I believe and I doubt. I hope and I get discouraged. I love, and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty about not feeling guilty. I am trusting, and I'm suspicious. I'm honest, and I still play games. Aristotle said I'm a rational animal. I say I'm an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. I don't know if any of those hit with you or not. I don't know if you're, if you, if you're prone to saying that you're always honest. I don't know if you're prone to saying that you love and yet you still hate. I think honesty causes us to look at the sins. And I, I, honesty causes us to see that we usually live in a sin-based area in our life. God kind of worked on me in, in, in all of this because, and I told her since so about I am prone to telling you that you got saved. Okay? There's a salvation line. We all understand that there's a salvation line. We crossed it and we became a new creature. Good enough, right? I'm prone to saying, well, now that you're on that side of the line, in theory, there's no sin in your life. There shouldn't be any sin in your life. But in reality, it's still there. The way we live shows that it's still there. The way we talk with one another, the way we interact with one another, our attitudes about certain things prove that the sin is still in our life. And sometimes I want to believe that when you sin, you're more connected. You're just not listening. And I even say it that way. But when you read the Bible, Paul understood that it's there. Paul struggled with the fact that it was there. We did a verse a long time ago, and we, and we hammered it. I mean, all the time. He, he, here's what Paul said. It's in Romans, and he said, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. Y'all remember that? I do not understand what I do. I don't know what I do. Remember that? Do, do, do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I have the desire to do what is good. Y'all have a desire to do what's good? You like Paul? Okay. But I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. So you all understand that there's things you want to do, and there's all you understand there's things that you don't want to do, and we cross them. We do the opposite all the time. So who am I when I do that? Do we understand who we are right there when we do it? What do I look like? What's causing me to do it? Because, see, I think if we see the semantics, I'm a picture guy. If I can picture what I'm doing, it may cause me to stop doing some of it. It may cause me, or at least cause me to realize that I am sinning. Because, you see, we're so good at understanding when other people are sinning, right? But we seem to have a knack for 
forgetting that we're sinning. So I want to go back to the very beginning when this whole thing started. Paul finishes, y'all remember how Paul finishes that little verse? I said, he said, what a wretched man I am. See that? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Who? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we, we know that, that Jesus is the one who rescues us. We just have to be able to tap in to re that understanding when we need him to rescue us. And we, we're so good at uh, looking back at last week. Y'all know what you did last week, right? Y'all know when you sinned last week? You thinking about four days ago? Oh, I did that. Why about a minute ago? That's how current we need to get. So we can realize when it happens, we can understand our need for that grace. We can understand what happened to cause us to do it. Let's look at the Genesis 2 verse 8. This, this is when sin started. This is when all things started. All right, this is what the Bible calls the fall. I'm going to read my verse now. It's a little, it may be a little different than your words, but that's okay. It's kind of follow along. Your verse is probably different than one bring up right. Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye, good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, two trees. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And I'm skipping a few verses so you're having trouble following. For God knows that when you eat of the uh, eyes of the open, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. That sin, when it first entered the world, and we like to blame a lot of stuff on it, but I'm going to show you there's a parallel there to what you just did yesterday or this morning before you came to church. And you can find the reasons why you sin. Right there, in all those passages. So if you got a pen, you may want to surface it though. Because it, it really jumps out after you have to read and hear about it. First thing, see what happens when we sin. And it involves a tree, a serpent, and a fruit. All three pieces. Every time you sin, all three pieces are there. Now I'm going to challenge you to look in your life and see those three areas in everything you've done or any time you step away from God or when you sin. We're going to keep using the word sin because I don't think we are going to forget it. It means step away from God. It means lose your relationship. Not lose your relationship. To break that relationship a little bit or to put distance. It means all those things, but it's still sin. God created paradise for Adam and Eve. He had created the whole deal and he said, it's all yours. Gave it to him. The beauty, the, the pleasure, the wonder, everything that's created. And he said, Free. You're free. Run. Play. Enjoy. Create. Eat. Drink. Have a great time. Don't do one thing. That tree over there, leave it alone. Don't touch it. You can eat every single tree out of here. Everything that's grown up is producing something for you to eat. Everything but that. Leave that one thing away. Can you imagine the amount of stuff? It's, I, I believe, I don't believe the Garden of Eden was like the size of this room. I believe the Garden of Eden was probably some pretty good acreage. I mean, it had everything. So I think about like rainforests. A, a large section of the rainforest, and God's like, everything in here. That one tree right here in the middle? Do you And where did they go? I mean, anybody got kids? Anybody ever got a kid? I always get you with that one. I mean, what's up with that? What have you been doing with that one? It, it's actually something that lies at the very heart of why you do what you do. Because you see, God created an opportunity, a choice. He was setting up in there, just sitting there, a choice. Because you know what? God didn't want to create a bunch of people who would just mindlessly follow him. You ever been accused of just mindlessly following him? He didn't want to do that. He wanted to create a, a people who would choose to follow him. Boom! Don't mess with that tree. Have everything else, and it's all going to be perfect. If you do everything else, you'll have everything you need. Your life will be completely fulfilled. You will want for nothing. As long as you don't mess with that tree. <laughs> they chose. That tree. They, they stood by that tree and had a choice. Continue in a perfect relationship with God or 
be their own God to make their decision. It's kind of like a kid. If you've ever taken a child outside and said, okay, you can play right here in our, I imagine our front yard, if there's grass and then there's pavement, you can play up to the pavement. Don't go on the pavement. Play in the grass. Don't go in the pavement. Where do the kids go? Nothing's wrong with the pavement. I tested the pavement. That didn't hurt. See, nothing happened to me. And they spent a little more time on the pavement. And then they run back right over here and make sure I'm not watching. Then they found pavement on there. I don't know about pavement, okay. That pavement's okay too. Y'all are foolish. I don't know what my parents would think, but there's nothing wrong with the pavement. We don't play on the pavement. Make a choice. So at the heart of all that, the heart of that, the first thing you do when you decide to sin is rebel. You rebel. You're all rebellious teenagers. We are all rebellious teenagers. How many teenagers are in here? Much. You can learn a lot from a teenager. We can learn a lot. We can teach a lot to the team. Because you see, God does that to you every single day. There is this boundary, Christian, that you need to live in. And if you live there, your life will be perfect. Your life will be fulfilled. You will have absolutely every single thing you need. You will want for nothing, and you will have a great time doing it. As long as you don't go on the pavement. And you and I get up every single morning, we go to the edge of the pavement, and we go, nothing wrong with the pavement, God. Look, I was over there, nothing happened. I'm still a good person. Look, look, look at all the other people on the pavement. Doesn't hurt anybody to be on the pavement. How many of you have looked at your kids and said, I don't care what other people tell their kids to do? If I don't, right? Yes. Well, if the other kids' parents would have told you to jump off the bridge, would you? And that's God. God's like, I don't care what the other kids got that saying. I said don't go to pavement. So we're rebellious. And then we look at our kids and go, why are you so rebellious? Why can't you just do what I tell you to do? In our house, it's about cleaning rooms. I showed you pictures that kind of look like our kids. Why can't you simply pick up your underwear from the bathroom floor? Why? You took them off. You know they were there. You, you stepped over them. Take it out. Clean up your mess. And it's like they walk by and go, underwear is still there. We're still on. Nothing wrong. And yet you and I will walk out of this room, get in our cars, and basically look at God and go, Come on. this is where I live. Now. There's nothing wrong with me. Nothing wrong with me. You're still going to love me. I still got great. You're rebellious. It's the truth. That's the truth. Funny. Bill Hyde, I went, I go to a lot of leaders for conferences up in Chicago. Bill told this story. First year I was there. He said he had just done a sermon series on sin. And this guy caught him outside the church and he said, Bill, listen, all the talk about sin is making me feel bad. <laughs> he said, now all the stuff you're talking about, I don't do that. You know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't do none of that bad stuff. Bill said, well, he said, Bill said, I think I, I felt like I could shoot straight with the guy. I've been around a while. He said, so, let me ask you a question. The guy said, shoot, Bill. Bill said, you've been married 25 years. Have you been 100% faithful to your wife in both your thoughts and in your actions? The guy said, you know, I'm a traveling salesman. I spend a lot of time on my own. You know what I'm saying. Bill said, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. So, well, they'll say, well, you know, when you're, when you're out, you're feeling out your expense reports, and he 
you get back. You ever put anything on there that's not exactly a business expense? No, not exactly. Yeah, Bill, you know, that's just industry stuff. I mean, everybody, you know, we, you can't track every single dollar. You know, you got, there's, there's going to be some great stuff. I understand that. That's good. Bill, say, have you ever told one of your customers, and that stuff you're selling, you know, that stuff you've got and you're getting them to take over, have you ever told them that they'll do something that you really do? Or you told them it's going to ship tomorrow, and you know it's not going to ship the next Tuesday? You ever done that? And they got like, man, you know, that, we've got that kind of stuff built into our industry. It, it's just the way you do things. That's not what I understand. He says, so basically you're telling me you're an adultery cheating liar. <laughs> and the guy said, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not, let's not use those first. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not use those first. Bill had a chance to sit and talk to him and say, listen, it doesn't do you any good to water it down. It doesn't do you any good to change what it looks like or to change how you call it. An adulterous, cheating liar is what you just described your life as being. Don't tell me you don't say it. Bill didn't even have to tell the guy, don't go out there and not do those things. Because the realization of that causes you to look at God and say, I need some. Andy Stanley likes to call it, I made a mistake. You ever call it making it a mistake? I looked up what the word mistake meant in the dictionary. And it says, Decided to rebel against God. Took at least a third of the angels with him. That's what the Bible teaches about that. 
And they chose to enter rebellion against God. Chose to break off from God. Chose to go and do what they wanted to do. And, and stay down here and, and live in this realm. Surveys tell us that, that if you go out and survey you, non-Christians, yeah, you just cross the board, you survey everybody, you ask them about heaven, yeah, I don't believe in heaven. Believe in God, yeah, I don't believe in God. You believe there's a God named Jesus? Yeah, I believe in God named Jesus. What about the devil? Oh, oh that's funny stuff. You know, you got a little red hat. And that's funny. Y'all are cute with that devil stuff. Hell no. There's no hell. I didn't say hell no. I said hell, comma. No, there's no hell. Just clear that up for the Baptist. Gets me in trouble. There's no hell. I don't believe in hell. Y'all get past that. We gotta go. Um, uh, <laughs> Satan comes up short. Oh, uh, asking people about him. He, he just doesn't exist. You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to acknowledge him. People don't want to acknowledge him. That he's there. He's real. He's absolutely active in everybody's life. And, and he. You notice he didn't walk up to Eve, dress in a little pitchfork, and go, hey, I'm the devil. We need to talk. No, he deceived her. And he, he dressed up like a snake. And you might be looking at that story. If you look at that story, you notice that, that it said the serpent said. There was a talking snake. You might be thinking, not really deceptive. But let's put it in context. Eve probably just walked away from talking to a bear. Probably just walked away from having a conversation with a wolf. The Bible clearly teaches that it was a little different in the Garden of Eden. And that they had communication with the animals. Some of you still think your dogs are going to talk back? I understand. That kind of stopped somewhere along the fall. But Eve evidently didn't get surprised at a snake. Wandering up to her about head height going, what's up? <laughs> she just kind of went, looking at the tree. And he just kind of talked to her. So he did deceive her. He deceived Eve into just a little communication. Just, he just kind of broke the ice with Eve. They hung out together. Eve didn't see that it was safe. Neither did you. You don't ever see that Satan has deceived you into an area. You don't ever see that Satan has used something that seemingly wouldn't surprise you, but he uses it to lure you into his area. You get deceived. You deal with a serpent. You see, Jesus took Satan very seriously. He talked about it. He acknowledged that he's out and around, and he done. Jesus himself communicated with him. When, when Satan took him out and tempted him, he realized that he was there. So who are you when you sin? You're deceived. Notice that the, 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 the guy he's talking to him said, you can't really say that. You know, he's saying, I'm sure the serpent they're talking about the two, they're like, that was good, didn't it? That, that. I don't know if it was an apple. I mean, yeah, we could spend a lot of time studying an apple, pomegranate, banana, who cares? It was just cool looking. He said, why are you eating that one? I mean, look at how much there is. I mean, this tree is overloaded. I mean, look how much is on the ground. It would be bad stewardship not to eat some of it. Okay, <laughs> Christians. And he's like, oh, I'm not supposed to. I don't know why. I'm not supposed to. I'm supposed to eat all that other stuff over there. And it's really good. I mean, the stuff that I make, the casseroles I'm able to make with the stuff that God gave me is to die for. I mean, she's talking to the serpent. Everything, you know, it's just awesome stuff. And the devil keeps going, but well, what about that one? Don't you wonder what it tastes like? I can just see it happen. Because it happens every day to you and me. Don't you wonder what it's like? Don't, don't you wonder what it's like? Don't you wonder what's going to happen? Because sure, if God didn't tell you not to eat it, he didn't say that you were he didn't say that. He didn't say you're going to die, did he? I, it was almost like Satan saying, listen, I was there. You know, I was the snake over there, set between you two, whenever God said, go have it all. I was the one not going, sounds like a good idea. But I didn't hear him say, don't eat it. 
Maybe he said, don't eat a lot of it. Maybe he said, just have, just use it. And somewhere along the way, Eve was like, no, you're right. I, uh, you know, the thing's getting a little old. The, the fruit's getting a little, I've had enough. I need to try something new. You're right, that looks pretty good. I think I'll take some. You got it. Thank you. She stood there, chose to rebel, got deceived by the devil to do it. That's where you are. There's a tree in your life where you choose to rebel, and there's a serpent in your life who's deceiving you and telling you that it's really okay. The stuff that I don't want. I want to do the things that I know that are right. I don't do them. The things that I know that are wrong, I do those anyway. You're being deceived. And the world isn't helping. I understand that. But please, Christian, quit blaming it on the world. But the world says it's okay. And all of them out there, they're, they're the ones dumbing it down. They're the ones telling me it's okay. I mean, they've convinced everybody that it's okay. And if they convince everybody that it's okay, then it must be okay for me. I can't go against that kind of tide, can I? I can't fight against that stream. Uh-huh, can. They're not being deceived. They're walking the same path. Christians are being deceived. God really say you should do that. I'll tell you back to the story. It was in 1960. This guy named Stanley Milgram, he wanted to prove, he, he did the most famous psychological experiment ever done. It, today it's banned, can't do it anymore. He got away with it, he's at Yale. What he wanted to find out is if he could convince somebody to send an electric shock to another person in another room, they couldn't see who they could hear, and to see how much voltage he could convince the one person to send to the other person, causing the pain. Sounds weird. Sounds okay, right? So he set it up. Here's how it went. He set up a fake electronic machine. He set up an actor in another room. And he convinced the person sitting in the machine that they were a teacher. And they had to teach the person in the other room two words. And every time there was a mistake to learn the two words, he could increase the voltage by 15 volts. The teacher could and he believed in his heart, honestly, when he started it, that there was no way people were going to sit in that room and shock people up to 450 volts, which is lethal. But he found out that over 65% of the people would continue to shoot the voltage to him as long as he stood behind them and said, it's okay, science, we have to do this. This experiment is critical to science. You just keep going. Even though the actor would scream and scream and scream, and at the last voltage would scream and seemingly pass out to what the teacher would have thought was death. 65% of the people pushed them to 450 volts. 60 were deceived. Do you realize, do you understand? Let me see, you don't understand. Let's show the story. Here's the one question he was trying to answer. How could thousands of SS soldiers gas, hang millions of innocent people under the seemingly authority of their commander chief. At the experiments he realized people can do anything. They can do anything they're convinced it's okay to do. And that's where you and I live. We live in a world where you and I are convinced that it's okay to do some things that the Bible says there's no way in the world you should do it. None. And we live in an area where we've dealt with a serpent long enough that we're deceived. So you got a tree and you got a serpent. Last thing brings you to that fruit. The actual fruit that she picked off the tree. Rebellion is at the heart. Deception is key. Look what the fruit does. This is textbook. I mean, this one's a textbook. I think that's why God did it. Genesis 3.6. Put that back up there where you're going to see what God says. 
three things about the fruit. You need to write these down in your book because these show up every single time you sin. Every single time. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom. All three things. All three things will show up. First, he said the fruit was good for food. Translation, the sin played to an instant pleasure. Instantly. I want you to think in your mind, porn sites. I'm going to use the big ones because I'm not going to get into your life. I'm going to assume that y'all are stuck on porn. Porn sites, offer. Instant gratification, you just click here. It's pleasing to the eye. And we end up clicking it. Second, she said, it was, no, no, that was good for food, sorry. Pleasing to the eye. It was something she wanted to have. Something she, she wanted to own it. She wanted the, the desire showed up. Okay, think, it's a porn site who gives you a new car just for joining. <coughs> Pleasure vote. Pleasing to the eye. What? Third thing she says. Desirable or gaining wisdom. It promised to hit a little bit of her ego. It promised to give her something that she had deep down inside of her wanting to gain. You see, remember, you stand there going, I don't know what I'm not supposed to do. I mean, how many of you can understand your kids are going, can you just tell me why I can't go on the thing? You ever made a decision for any of your kids, and the only question they've caught is, why? But, why, Mom? And then they make me back their eyes. Please tell me. Just, just tell me why. I mean, I won't do it, but just tell me why. They want it. They want the wisdom. So think, a porn site that gives you away a sports car. And then Evelyn elevates you to American Idol. That's what it does. All three pieces of that will show up in every single scene. It is something you desire, it's something you want, and it's something that makes you do it for the rest of your life. Every time. I dare you to go find one that doesn't do it. Who you are when you sin is not who you want to be. You understand that? That's what Paul's saying. When I sin, I'm not who I want to be. When you sin, you're not who you were created to be. So who are you? You're a rebellious. Deceived, temptation, <laughs> rebellious, deceived, getting over to temptation first. That's the reality you and I live in. That's, that's, that's our world. Your personal world is absolutely good. But you can realize when those things come, when you can realize that you're staring at something that you know you shouldn't have. Even though that you don't, maybe don't know why you shouldn't have it. When you can understand that you're staring at a place you shouldn't go. Staring at, staring at a word you should have. Shouldn't have. When you can see it for that thing, you can stop it. Then you can stop it. You can realize that you need to be living in some more country. You can realize that God is there for all that stuff. Every single thing. You'll end up not beating yourself up over your sin. You'll end up realizing that you need God a whole lot more than you think you do. I'm convinced that you and I as Christians believe that the world needs Jesus. Y'all believe that? The world needs Jesus. Guess what? You need Him just as much. You need Him in your life way more often than you give Him credit for. Yes, they need Him to get saved. You need Him to walk this way. You need, you need to be tapping into it. I don't know what that looks like to you, but I know you need to do it. And I know you need to live there. Not just kind of be there. So what am I going to say? I'm going to say And realizing that makes me understand that God understood I was a 
and he sent Jesus to save you. Because that's the only thing a sinner needs to save you. Without it, you will always be sinning. Brings us back full circle of what Paul said. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. Then he finishes. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law. But my sinful nature a slave to the law. But in my sinful nature a slave to the law. I could be a slave to God's law. Now you got to go put this in action. Somebody could have said good preaching. <laughs> if it's good preaching, I uh, wasn't asking you to acknowledge it. I was asking you to understand that it is good for our life. But now you've got to go put it into action. Because hearing it, understanding it, agreeing with it, and a porter will get you a cup of coffee in our cafe. But that's all of it. Do you put it in action? And you see your relationship grow? Or do you open it? So there's your challenge. Go out there and let's live this thing. Let's live this thing. Let me pray. God, I thank you that you have given us your word to come and to just inhabit our life. That, it, that, you, that it, it's ever changing. It's, it's always just breaking us down. God, I pray that as we go out of here, that we'll spend this next week. Get into a habit of understanding when we're starting down this path of sin. Then we'll realize, that we'll visualize this tree that, that Eve saw. We'll, enter, we'll visualize Satan as he's inhabiting something that doesn't seem out of the ordinary. And then we'll understand the temptation to reach up and grab it. Thank you for all this that you've put in place that we can tap into as a resource to build a relationship with this person. Teach us that's the most important thing that I love you. Love you. Your name is I mean, just encourage you to go out and do all this and just kind of just listen to God today. Uh, we got some help part tonight as we leave here. Yeah, we're going to leave at 530 because traffic is like nuts, right? So we'll leave at 530 from the parking lot. If you already live off the island, we'll meet you at Health Park off Bass Road at, uh, sometime after 5.30 uh, when we get there. Our goal is to be there by 6 o'clock. We need everybody that we can get to come down. I had a great turnout two weeks ago. We do this every other week, so we need as many help as we can get. Look at your bulletin and there's everything that's going on. We want you to be a part of it because while you're in town, you're, you're our family because you're God's family. One thing you've got to put a big X through. You need to look in there. There is no tailgate party in downtown Fort Myers next Friday night, March 15th. That's not going to happen. Not the tailgate party. Our youth are still playing at Music Walk downtown Fort Myers. We're still leaving the bus, or leaving on the bus, at 6 o'clock from our parking lot to take you down if you want to go to Music Walk and kind of enjoy Music Walk. We're just not feeding you in the parking lot. You have to eat on your own. And I know that, that just, that's a stab to the heart. <laughs> Really a bigger stack than me who goes, now I don't know where I'm going to eat. But I got a week to figure that out. So just no tailgate party. Everything else is going on right on time. Let's all stand together. Hey, if y'all got a song, y'all can just go out there and we can go out and song. I just, I told you I didn't know if we were going to do one. Let's sing a song. The mouse said they sang a song coming out, didn't it? I'm sure that's out of context, but let's do it. We'll be dismissed with this song. That's what you can do with professionals. You can put them on the spot. Hey, did y'all know this is Bob's and uh, Joanne's uh, grandpa? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Grandson. Ah, it's the shorts. It's the shorts that should have given it away. He said he was trying to dress like grandpa. Where's Bob at? He's hiding. There he is. <laughs> Grandson, yeah. Let's sing.
You want to have fellowship with us. You want to be doing life with us. But as we have sang the song that nothing can separate us from the love of God, but we know that nothing can break our adoption. Nothing can take us away from the love of the cross. That Christ so loved the world that he gave his only son. That Jesus Christ died on the cross. And the Bible says we believe in him we should not perish but have everlasting life. And so often sin keeps us from intimacy with you. And you stand at the door and you knock. And if any man open the door, you will come in and suffer with him and heal with him. So today, Lord, if there's anyone here today, we all could e e easily put our hands up as we've heard all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But Lord, if you put your finger on a part of our life that says, hey, I'm knocking and I'm on the other side. We haven't had a talk for a long time. Lord, would they open the door today we are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We may open the door today and have the courage to allow you to come in and forgive them and walk again closer with them in your friendship. We leave today in prayer. Give us the courage, Lord. Help us to do this. Walk close. Not be satisfied with the life where we just hear the knock at the door. Let us, Lord, want to be face to face with you. In Jesus' name.